This chapter is about time series decomposition, but before we do that, we need to talk a little bit about how to prepare our data so that it's ready for decomposition. I'm going to talk you through transformations and adjustments to data. So first up, let's talk about per capita adjustments. That's where you divide the data by the population so that instead of looking at totals, you're looking at totals per capita. So here's an example of GDP data. This is for Australia. Uh, so it's GDP um, annually since 1960. Um, and of course, the population has also grown over that time. So if you're interested in uh, understanding the growth of the economy, you need to think about the economy relative to the size of the population. So we can simply divide through by population and we get uh, a data set which is per capita. And then often it's better to model that, model the per capita data. And if you need to have the data back in terms of the original thing, in this case GDP, you would then also forecast population separately and multiply the two forecasts together. So that's what I mean by an adjustment. That's where you take the data and you modify it in some way before you do the modeling. Um, this is another example. This one's a little more complicated. I'm gonna step through it in R. So this is where you adjust for inflation. So uh, first of all, we'll load the packages that we're going to use. And uh, as usual, it tells you what version numbers we're, we've got. And I'm going to take this data set here, which is Australian retail data on lots of different industries. There's 152 series here, split by industry and by state. So I'm going to pull out just newspaper and book retailing. Um, and then we'll group that by industry. I'm going to only do annual data. So I'll re-index it by the year rather than by month. And then I'll sum over uh, the states and over the months to get annual data for that particular industry. So that little section of code is going to do that. And just to show you what the result looks like. So now we have only one series, um, which is the newspaper and book retailing data aggregated across all of the states of Australia and across the months. So we get an annual series. Okay, so... Um, I'm interested in looking at this data um, having adjusted for inflation. So let me just do a plot of the data so you can see what it looks like. So we'll uh, take the print day retail data and we'll do an auto plot of the turnover numbers. And there we go. So we've got the data going up um, until around 2010 and then starting to drop as book and newspaper retailing has sort of diminished over time. The question is, is all of that due to just a change in the industry or is it potentially due to a change in CPI and change in the value of the Australian dollar? So we need to adjust this turnover by the CPI. So we, we have CPI data in the global economy data set. So here I'm just filtering out for Australia. So you can see that that data set contains annual Australian data from 1960, and it includes a column of CPI, the Consumer Price Index. So I'm going to link these two data sets together. So this first bit of the code takes my print data set and it links it to the Australian economy data set um, using the year as the thing it links on. And so you'll see that we've now got a bigger data set that combines the information in both of those data sets. Um, and for, for the years that they have in common, which starts in 1982. Now, I want to take my turnover and adjust it by CPI. So you can see CPI is here. Um, so I'm going to divide by CPI and multiply by 100 so that I get on the same scale as the original data. So I create a new variable called adjusted turnover, um, and it's going to look like that. You can just see it on the end there. So this is the adjusted turnover. So it's the turnover divided by the CPI and then multiplied by 100 so that it's back on the same scale because the CPI has a 100 index. And now I want to plot both of those things, the original turnover data and the adjusted turnover data. So do a little bit of uh, wrangling of the data uh, so that I can set it up for a ggplot. Um, so this little bit of code here is just setting it up ready to do a nice ggplot. So let's just pipe all of that in. Um, and you can see the code there, so you can copy it and try it out yourself. 
And there you go. So what's the take home message here? It's actually that once you adjust by CPI, it's been declining since way back in the 1980s. The, the decline since 2010 is much faster, but the decline has been going on since way back in the 1980s. So this increase here that you see in the top graph is purely due to an increase in the value of the dollar. And it's not actually a real increase in the um, in book and newspaper retailing in Australia. So adjusting by CPI helps you understand those things. And when you're forecasting, you often want to forecast um, having taken into account CPI. So you do the adjust by CPI and then you do the forecasts. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what that was about. Um, and I've just shown you that plot. So the third type of transformation I want to talk about is a mathematical transformation where you take your data and you transform it in some way using a mathematical function. So there's lots of mathematical functions that get used for this. Um, so if I let my original observations be denoted by y, y1 up to yt, and the transformed observations be denoted by w, then we might take a square root. So you just take the square root of all the y's to get a new series. You might take a cube root, you might take a logarithm or some other transformation. Now these are actually getting stronger. They're doing more um, to the data as, um, as we go through this list. Um, logarithms are probably the most useful of those three because they become quite interpretable. A change in the log value is equivalent to a relative or percentage change on the original scale. Um, and so that can be quite a useful um, transformation to use, whereas square roots and cube roots are a little harder to interpret what's going on. If you think about these three as, as points on a scale, um, we can actually define a lot of other transformations that are different points on that scale. So let me show you an example. This is Australian food retailing data. So I'm constructing the data set by taking that Australian retail data and only pulling out food retailing, and then I'm going to sum over all of the states. So I get monthly data that looks like that. Now, the idea of a transformation is to try to make the, um, the variation in the series more homogeneous. So you see here, down at this end, quite small variations, whereas at this end of the data, they have quite big variations. It's bouncing around between those numbers, which is you know, quite a large range. The idea of doing a transformation is to make it more even across the scale of the data. So if I take a square root, you can see it's a little more even, but it's still more variation at this end than there is down at this end. So it's not quite a strong enough transformation. If I take a cube root, it's a bit stronger, and I can see that now it's, it's more even, but I still have sort of the variation down here is smaller than the variation I've got up here. If I take a log, it's now much more even across the scale. The, the size of the fluctuations down this end are about the same size as the fluctuations at this end, which is going to make modeling easier. It's going to make time series decomposition easier. So it's a good first step to, uh, to remove that heterogeneity so that then you can fit a more simple model. I could go even further. I could take an inverse transformation, which has now gone too far. Now the variation at the top end up here is much smaller than the variation down the bottom end. So that's gone too far. The log was about right on that list of transformations. So the, each of these transformations is actually um, can be thought of in a continuous scale of transformations, uh, which are known as the Box-Cox transformations. And lambda describes how strong the transformation is. Um, so if lambda is zero, we just take a logarithm and as in as, as usual in statistics, when we talk about logarithms, we need natural logarithms. Uh, and if lambda is not equal to zero, we do this transformation, which raises the data to the power of lambda and then subtracts one divided by lambda. The reason for the sign is to be able to deal with negative values. So this is actually not strictly a Box-Cox transformation. It's a development um, after Box and Cox came up with their transformation. This is called a bickle doxum transformation. Um, the difference being the, the sign part here, which allows for y's less than zero. So if lambda equals one, then um, 
you know, we're saying y to the power of one. So that gives you the y again, minus one divided by one. So all you're doing is shifting the data down by a single value. So it's just shifting on the law, on the vertical scale. Lambda as a half is similar to a square root. Lambda zero is exactly the same as a natural logarithm. Lambda equals minus one is similar to an inverse, again, with a followed by a level shift. Okay, so this whole family of transformations enables us to do, um, to look at trend to all different types of transformations. So this is lambda equals one. And I'm going to just run through what these look like as lambda decreases, as it goes from one, goes down, um, gets smaller and smaller, and the transformation gets stronger. So lambda equals one is essentially no transformation. And here we go, getting smaller, and you can see that the transformation is getting stronger. And at some point, the variation in the series is about even, about there. Um, and then right, we've gone back to the start. Let me just go to the end. Oops. There we go. So it's getting stronger and stronger. And we need to choose the value of lambda where the variation is about even. And it's about there. So the size of the fluctuations is about the same here as it is down here. So that's what we're doing with the box box transformation is to remove that heterogeneity in the data. There is a function in the package which enables you to automatically choose a lambda, which is meant to um, be the optimal in some sense. So it's called a Guerrero transformation named after the Mexican statistician, Victor Guerrero. Uh, and you take your data and you ask it to compute features on the turnover variable. And the feature you want is the Guerrero feature. And it comes back with this little one by one tibble, uh, which says that the value is 0 0.0895. So that optimizes the uh, transformation. It gives you the most even distribution across the scale. If I show you what that looks like. Um, I'll firstly, just to explain, it's attempting to balance the seasonal fluctuations and the random variation so it doesn't change much from year to year. It is always worth having a look, though, to make sure it's it's done what you expect it to have done. Uh, sometimes it gives you some weird results, which is why I don't always automate this process. Um, and, it, and you also need to be careful if lambda gets really small, particularly negative, you can have quite wide prediction intervals that may be not what you want. So I generally try to choose lambda a little bit on the positive side of what might be optimal. So. Um, so there's, a, there's an example where I've, I've chosen one a little bit on the underside. And you see it's much the same as, um, as the point 0.1 transformation there. Um, the optimal is somewhere between them, but you probably can't tell the difference between that one and that one. So you don't have to be you know, exact, just get something that works reasonably well. Generally, you, don't, you, you may not need a transformation. Uh, if you do need one, I'll usually try to for something that's simple. So if it's anywhere near zero, I'll just use zero because that gives me a log and that's easier to explain. Um, and you don't have to be, you know, get the absolutely optimal one. It's not going to make that much difference to the results. The transformations can have a particularly large effect on the prediction intervals, though. PI there stands for prediction intervals. So be careful going too small. Um, if you've got some zero or negative values, then you can sometimes have trouble with um, negative lambdas, so be careful there. Uh, there's another transformation that I'm not mentioning here, which is the log 1p transformation, which is often used when your data have zeros in it, but you still want something like a log that adds one and then takes a log. Um, choosing logs is also has the nice effect of forcing all the forecasts to stay positive. And if you want positive forecasts, which you often do, then using logs first can be a good way to achieve that. Of course, when you work on the transform data, at the end of the day, you're going to have to back transform to, uh, to see the results on the original scale. Um, fortunately, using the Fable package, that's all taken care of for you. So we, we don't have to actually do undo the transformations. When we get to doing the forecasting later on, that will be automatically undone, regardless of what transformation we have used. OK. I think that's enough on transformations. Um, we can now start talking about decomposition.